Well, good morning, church family. So glad to see you here and a welcome to all those who are watching online this morning. Uh, as we begin, I want to give a shout out and a huge thank you to uh, all of our volunteers who were here last night uh, rocking the, uh, the Bethlehem journey. Uh, it was amazing, but as, I'm, as you can imagine, every hour it got colder and colder and colder. And so they were, some of them were five hours serving last night uh, right until eight o'clock. Uh, but praise God, man, our volunteers were amazing, uh, caroling and acting, all the little kids out there in their angels and shepherd costumes, uh, uh, persevering through the cold. And, uh, and we're told that we had over, there's like 120 cars or so, I believe, maybe upwards of 300 people came through last night. Uh, some of our church family, some of you guys actually went through the whole journey and, uh, and was told that the gospel message was very clear and, uh, and precise, and so we praise God for that. And, and we pray this morning, maybe in our churches, in our community, uh, many people will be coming this morning uh, because of what they witnessed last night. So thank you, thank you, thank you to all of our volunteers who put in the time and the effort last night. Uh, we rejoice and we say, praise God. Uh, this morning, we are continuing our Christmas series called The Light That Breaks Our Darkness. I want to remind you that uh, we have communion this morning, and so you can be preparing your hearts for that. You can also uh, grab a communion cup if you have not yet done so already. I also want to let you know that because it's communion, we receive a benevolent offering uh, this Sunday as well. And so on your way out, we have our normal offering box there, but there's also an offering plate uh, so if you want to give some extra to our benevolent fund, we would encourage you to do that. And please join us after the service out in the tent for a cafe. Uh, we got a big old heater in there, so it's, I don't know how warm it is, but it'll be warmer than just being outside. So please enjoy some fellowship and some coffee after the service. And I'm told this week there actually is hot chocolate this week. So we're just making that clear, Brett. There is hot chocolate out there for you. Well, this time, church family, would you take your Bibles and let's find Matthew chapter 2. And let's begin our service and begin our worship by reading God's word together. Matthew chapter 2, this will be our text of focus this morning as we center our minds around the theme of joy. Joy, we are celebrating this, the second week of Advent. And so if you have your Bibles, follow along Matthew chapter 2 and beginning to read at verse 13 down to verse 23. Matthew chapter 2. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious, and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem, and in all that region who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted, because they are no more. In verse 19, but when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. And he rose and took the child and his mother, and they went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in the place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a city called Nazareth that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, he shall be called a Nazarene. And may God bless the reading of his word this morning. Well, this time I'm going to invite the Guter family to come on up, and they are going to read and pray for us and focus our minds now on the advent of joy. During the, during the second week in Advent, we spend time thinking about joy. From 5, verse 11, we hear these, those word, these words. But let all who take refuge in you rejoice. Let them ever sing for joy. 
spread your protection over them so that those who love your name may exult in you. In the Old Testament, the word joy is nearly always associated with an act of God, and even more specifically with an act of God delivering his people. The people of Israel found themselves in need of God's deliverance on more than one occasion. When they were enslaved in Egypt, God set them free. As they traveled to the promised land, God proved to the Israelites over and over again that he was far stronger and more powerful than the enemy nations who opposed them. When the nation of Israel was carried off into captivity by the Babylonians, again they cried out to God to rescue them. And God delivered them and brought them back to Jerusalem. Each time they were rescued, the Israelites were joyful and rejoiced in God's love for them. But each time they soon forgot God's deliverance and turned away from God. In a cold and dirty stable in the small, unimportant town of Bethlehem, God again delivered his people. This time, however, it was not just for a time. Not just until the next warring nation came across the river. This time it was forever, for eternity. God sent his son to deliver his people, not just from enemies who threatened them, but from their sin that separated them from himself. We can imagine the joy on the faces of the shepherds as they made their way to the stable. We can almost see the joy on the faces of the wise men who traveled great distances to find this new king. And we can feel the radiant joy of Simeon and Anna in the temple as they came face to face with the savior of the world. God sent himself to us to bring us life and never any joy. Today, as we celebrate Advent and think of joy, let's not forget. Let's remember and live each day in the knowledge and understanding of what God has done for us. We are delivered. How can we not be joyful? Let's pray. Dear Lord God, we, what, a, what a joyous time of the year this should be for us, Lord. For some of us, it's, it's a, a lonely or de depressing time. For some of us, it's, it brings back bad memories, Lord. But through your spirit in us, Lord, you have, you have brought us a joy that, ex that exceeds what we can hold. And we, we spill it out onto other people as we meet them, Lord. Lord, in the midst of a, a pandemic, remind us that the greatest pandemic that affects this world is not the pandemic that's going around right now. It's the pandemic of sin. This affects us all and it, and it kills us not only um, in our families, in our bodies, but also our very souls, Lord. Help us to spread the joy that is in us that's undescribable and let other people see the light of Jesus in us everywhere we go. Amen. I feel like uh, Joy to the World would probably be the perfect Christmas song right now, but I completely forgot to pick Christmas songs, so <laughs> let's stand and worship anyways. <laughs>
blessing runs deep, your grace is more. Where grace is found is where you are. And where you are, Lord, I am free. Holiness is Christ in me.
your love never fails and never gives up and never runs out on me your love never fails and never gives up and never runs out on me your love your love never fails and never gives up and never runs out on me your love never fails and never gives up and never runs out on me your love never fails and never gives up and never runs out on me your love thank you you can be seated I want to take a moment right now to bow our heads and hearts together in prayer. Before this, I just want to read a short passage from the Valley of Vision, a collection of Puritan prayer and devotion. And there we read, my heart melts at the love of Jesus, my brother, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, married to me, dead for me, risen for me. He is mine and I am his, given to me as well as for me. I'm never so much mine as when I'm his, or so much lost to myself until I'm lost in him. Then I find my true humanity and meaning. Make me fruitful by living to that love, my character becoming more beautiful every day. If traces of Christ's love artistry be upon me, may he work on me with his divine brush until the complete image be obtained and I be made a perfect copy of him, my master. O Lord Jesus, come to me. O divine spirit, rest upon me. O Holy Father, look on me in mercy for the sake of the well-beloved. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we echo these words, Lord, as our soul longs to love you and to know and experience your joy in a real and lasting and profound way. Father, we're not talking about happiness as the world understands it, Father, but a joy that lifts us above circumstances, infuses our hearts with meaning and purpose, helps us to experience in a real way the love of Christ, and helps us, God, to manifest that love to everyone around us. God in heaven, we thank you for the privilege of gathering to worship. Thank you, O God, for meeting us in our sin and our need, our brokenness and our fear. And Father, granting to us peace and grace and mercy and comfort. Father in heaven, we pray for many right now who are sick and shut in. We think of when Trebner's mom in hospital right now and pray that you'd be bringing healing to her and strength to her. Help Luann, Lord, as she can't go in to visit right now and just uh, minister to this family at this time, Lord. God in heaven, we pray for the Strickland family and the loss of their 11-year-old son uh, who was struck by a vehicle father. We can't imagine this grief and we just pray for Jamie and Vanessa right now that you would be a comfort and help to them. Father in heaven, we pray for many over this time and this season that grieve the loss of a loved one and feel it so deeply and profoundly at Christmas. Father, we pray that you would be a comfort to them. God in heaven, we just pray also for many who came in and heard your word, some for the first time through the Bethlehem journey, that that word would do your work, God, and bring fruit to salvation for many people who heard it. Father in heaven, we pray that you would prepare our hearts this morning to hear your word and to submit to it, Lord. To hear your gospel and allow our hearts to be overwhelmed with your joy and your love. Father, as we meet around this table, prepare our hearts, Lord, to hear anew and afresh your gospel that draws us into a new awareness of the love of Christ for us, of your grace that you manifested towards us even while we are still sinners. 
And we pray, God, that as we reflect on this and meditate on it, our hearts would overflow with gratitude to you. Thank you, God, now for this time. And uh, Lord, we commit our hearts and our minds to you to be directed by your spirit. In Christ's name, amen. and continue to worship this morning. Thank you so much, worship team, church family. Let's take our Bibles now and let's find again Matthew chapter 2, as this is our text for this morning, Matthew chapter 2. So our focus this morning is on joy. And joy is both something that we, we already have it in Christ. It is a fruit of the Spirit. It's a gift of God. Yet at the same time, it's something that we must choose. It's something we fight for on a daily basis. Why? Because, well, we still have remaining sin in our lives and, and we still live in this broken, fallen world east of Eden and both these things seek to steal or rob away our joy. We experience this battle for joy on a daily basis, sometimes without even realizing it. And, and what's unique I find about Christmas is that most people realize that they don't have joy. They're kind of acting like they're happy and everything is all good, but underneath they realize, I don't have true joy, and they're trying to numb that pain through alcohol or drugs, or maybe they're just trying to fill their lives with more material things, but they find that life is still empty and something is still missing. They miss 
That true joy can only be found in Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen on that this morning? It's only found in Christ. So let's begin this morning by just simply kind of nailing down what joy is. I want to give you a definition, and this is not unique to me. This is defined by God in the scriptures and through many theologians who have mauled over this over the centuries, but joy is the internal sense of the goodness of God. It's the internal sense of the goodness of God toward me. It's produced by the Holy Spirit through my focus on the beauty of Jesus and his work. It's more than just a feeling of happiness. Nothing wrong with happiness, but that feeling can come and go. Joy is an internal confidence that despite my trials, despite my sufferings and sorrows right now, I know who I am in Christ. I am justified. And though though my present moment is dark, I know that my future is bright. What waits me in my future is glorification. And so joy this morning, J.R. Tolkien gives us a picture of this in Lord of the Rings, and uh, Emma Cowdice, if you're watching online, this reference is solely for you. Uh, but in the Lord of the Rings, there is the hobbit Pippin, and, and he has a relationship with Gandalf, he admires him, and they're sitting there having a conversation, and this is what the author writes. Pippin glanced in some wonder at Gandalf's face, now closed behind his own, for the sound of that laugh had been gay and merry. Yet in the wizard's face, he saw at first only lines of care and sorrow, though as he looked more intently, he perceived that under all there was a great joy, a fountain of mirth enough to set a kingdom laughing were it to gush forth. You see, in in Tolkien's fictional world, uh, Gandalf is kind of like an angel sent to serve the inhabitants of Middle-earth, right? And uh, and over the centuries, he goes, he's worn down by all the cares and sorrows and and the tolls of life has literally taken its toll on his his face. But beneath those lines of care and sorrow, Pippin notices something else, a fountain of joy, confidence in his eyes as Gandalf would look forward to the undying land. He knew his future. And as Christians, we can relate to this. We identify, we know that our joy is not overcome by sorrow. We can endure cancer an illness. We can't persevere through a pandemic. We can actually rejoice when others are persecuting us. Why? Because we have the presence of a supernatural joy. What do you mean supernatural? Listen to the words of Jesus. These things I have spoken to you, Jesus says, that my joy, my joy might be in you. The joy that Jesus had to empty himself and to endure the cross, that joy of Jesus is in us by the presence of his spirit. It's a joy that looks to the future, a joy that can say, as Paul said in Romans 8, 18, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed. And so this morning, the the aim of this sermon is just to simply help you realize that, yes, you have joy in Christ, but that we should also fight for joy by beholding the beauty of Jesus. Let me give you a picture if you want to think of what does it mean to, to behold the beauty of Jesus? Imagine, imagine Mary as she's sitting there holding her newborn child, looking, beholding the face of her son. Some of us have been there. You've been there with the, the birth of a, of a son, of a child. And you know in that moment, the first time you, you lay hold of your firstborn child, right, this, this sense of overwhelming joy I was literally laughing and crying at the same time. I don't know if any other dads can relate. I was just so, so much joy. I didn't know what I was doing. I was like a teenage girl laughing and crying at the same time. What's happening? It was amazing. And Mary, beholding her son, she has this sense of overwhelming joy. We can relate to that, but understand it goes even deeper. Because for Mary, not only is she holding her son, but she is holding her Savior. And she's flooded with joy. Let's turn our attention now to our text here in Matthew 2 and What we see in these verses is actually an explosion of joy, although you may not recognize it at first in the midst of very difficult circumstances. And and I realize that these verses are not very commonly talked about at Christmas time. When you're reading the Christmas story, I imagine you usually end at the the wise men departing back to their country. We don't typically continue on with this story. It just seems kind of dark and depressing. There's a mass murder that happens here, but the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not overcome it. Do you see what I did there? I was... Tying it back to the, you got that, all right. In these verses, these verses are rich with hope. They are rich with hope. And we're gonna see that three, we're gonna see how Matthew shows us how Jesus fulfills three Old Testament prophecies. And thus Jesus fulfills, or he, he, he inaugurates a new exodus. 
He ends the sorrowful exile and he loves his fiercest enemies. We're going to break these down, each one of them, but first let me just give you kind of the context. And so previous to this in, in Matthew 2, we have Mary and Joseph, uh, the, the, the Magi came to them, brought them gifts. They are rejoicing, but their joy quickly turned to sorrow as they received news of the intention of Herod, his plan to destroy their child. Mary and Joseph have been living on this, this mountaintop joyful experience for two years, and now conflict begins. But God is protecting his son. We see here the incredible providence of God, that even he can take even what men intend for evil, and he can work out his good, better purposes. This is God's providence. And Matthew is going to show us how even just the moving around of Jesus' family ensures the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies spoken of the Messiah. And so Mary and Joseph, they, 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 they get this word from the angel and they leave under the, the cover of nighttime. They travel a, a hundred miles on foot with a two-year-old to Egypt and you thought your Christmas commute was bad. Years later, Herod dies and, and, and they, they're, they're told to return to, to, to Israel, but they can't go to Judea because it's unsafe. Uh, Archelaus, Herod's son, is there, another ruthless leader, and so they end up in Nazareth. So that's kind of the, the big picture. Let's now break down each one of these and let's find three reasons for Christmas rejoicing. Number one is this. Jesus inaugurates the new exodus. We see this in verses 13 to 15. So, so why? Right, you read this and you go, why, why did they have to flee to Egypt? Why, what was, it, was it just for their safety? Yeah, it was for their safety, but I mean, God could have kept them safe by any number of means. So it was for their safety in part, but there's a bigger reason. Matthew tells us that this happened to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Hosea, out of Egypt I called my son. And you think, okay, like, like all of this just to, to fulfill a prophecy? Like, that seems a little bit extreme, doesn't it? Not when you realize what it is that God is revealing. God is revealing that a new deliverance is coming out of Egypt. When Hosea spoke those words, he was talking about the mercy of God in the Old Testament. When, when God brought his son, Israel, out of slavery, slavery at the hands of the Egyptians. But through Matthew, he was revealing how his mercy will come in the New Testament. That he will save his people from the slavery of sin through his perfect son, Jesus Christ, who just so happens to also come out of Egypt. You see the parallels are there and the picture is beautiful. Matthew wants us to see that this child, this child, this Jesus is the Messiah. He is the promised deliverer from God who is inaugurating a new exodus. And church family, we know if you read the pages of scripture from beginning to end that all humanity is in bondage or slavery to sin. And the penalty of our rebellion is death. If you have not yet trusted in Jesus, the Bible says you already stand condemned and you're destined to hell. That's the bad news. Matthew wants you to see the good news. He says, look at this child who comes out of Egypt. He is your deliverer. He will offer his life as a ransom for your sins so that you may be free. And throughout the rest of his letter, he will say that this gift of salvation is free. You cannot earn it. You don't deserve it. You receive it by faith. It's not based on your performance. It's based on the mercy of God. It's amazing grace. And it, this child, the salvation, the gospel is our source of joy. And so if you're here this morning and you feel like, man, my, my whole life, it just, just this, this idea that you're talking about, this, this joy, this supernatural joy has just always been out of reach. I've never experienced it. And perhaps maybe you do not have a relationship with Christ. That's your first step, to admit your sins and receive him by faith. And if you're here this morning and you, and you have been redeemed by Christ, but you find yourself fighting for joy through the broken circumstances right now, I, I encourage you to, to spend some time here mulling over and going deeper into this theological truth of our justification by faith. I guarantee it will flood your soul with joy. So that's our first reason for Christmas rejoicing. Jesus initiates or inaugurates a new exodus. Number two, he also ends the sorrowful exile. And we see that in verses 16 to 18, and this is kind of where the story gets pretty real. So Herod is furious, right? He's, he's tricked by the Magi, and he wants to destroy the child, doesn't know who it is, so he just orders that all the male children, two years and under, be killed in hopes of destroying Jesus. Historians would tell us that the population of Bethlehem at the time would have been just under 1,000, and so it's likely anywhere from 10 to 20 families lost children in this tragedy. Again, we can imagine the, the sorrow in the morning. As Tim was praying for the Strickland family this morning, we, we think of them, 11-year-old boy, just walking home from school this week, struck by a vehicle and taken just like that. 
the mourning, the sorrow, they understand. We, we understand Rachel in this text when Rachel just refuses to be comforted. Her sorrow is too great, just leave me alone. I don't even want to talk about it. It's too much for me to take. This, this quote actually comes from Jeremiah 31 and verse 15. And there the prophet Jeremiah is talking about when, when the Israelites, were, when the Jews were taken into exile. When the Babylonians came in and, and destroyed Jerusalem and, and raided their homes and and they, they took all the, the Jews and they actually took them north to this city called Ramah. And it was at this city in Ramah is where families were torn apart. Children taken from their parents and husbands and wives separated as they were carted off to various places all around the kingdom, never knowing if they're going to see their family again. And Matthew uses that experience in Ramah to, to kind of relate the feeling that is happening in Bethlehem. And again, you just kind of wonder as you're reading this, you're like, why Matthew? Like, like why bring this up? Why, why bring up these old memories that people want to forget? It's because there's a deeper significance to this prophecy. There's something deeper and bigger happening here. Look at what Jeremiah actually writes in verse 16 and 17. Right after this quote from Matthew, he says, This is what the Lord says. Keep your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears, for the reward for your work will come. This is the Lord's declaration. Your children will return from the enemy's land. There is hope for your future. Jeremiah tells the people in the midst of their tragedy that there is hope. God has not forgotten you. One will come and he's bringing a new covenant. And Matthew is saying to Bethlehem, yes, your pain is real, but there is hope for your future. In fact, that hope is here. The Messiah is here and he will end the sorrowful exile. And God is saying the same thing to you this morning. Yes, your pain is real this Christmas, but I have come to heal your hurts. And I have come to reconcile you to God. You realize that through faith in Jesus Christ, we have entered a covenant. One in which God makes promises to us that he will come through on. God promises that he will work all things together for our good, even our tragedies. He says that he will graciously give us all things. He will give us his spirit who will help us in our times of weakness. And he will accept no... Uh, no um, Charge, that's what I was looking for. No charge of condemnation against you. He sits right now at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us so that nothing can separate you from his love. I'm just quoting now from Romans chapter eight, and if you need to hear some good news this Christmas, hear this, that even when you are unfaithful to God, he remains faithful to you. So let me just give you very quickly three things to kind of remember this Christmas if you're suffering. The first is this, remember that God is with you. God is with you. You know, in the midst of pain and hurt, loneliness settles in, and often loneliness can hurt more than the physical pain itself. I think many have experienced that during COVID. You can experience loneliness in a room full of people, and one of the best promises we have from God is his abiding presence. He is Emmanuel, God with us, and the fact that he's present shows that he cares. He was with the disciples in the storm. He was with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the furnace. And he is with you by his spirit. And he gives us a peace that is beyond understanding. So I want to encourage you, church family, this morning that, like, go to those who need your presence this Christmas. Even if you don't have the words to say when they're in tragedy, just be there. Your presence will show that you care. Lend an ear, listen, pray, offer words of encouragement. Second thing to remember if you're suffering at Christmas is that suffering can reprioritize our lives. You see, in our culture, it's personal achievement and happiness. Those are the goals. And if the aim of your life is to be happy, then of course, any type of pain or adversity is going to be avoided. It's actually going to be hated because it's getting in the way of my goals. But the goal of the Christian life is different. Our goal is to live for the glory of God. We already have all we need in Christ. We already have joy. Our goal is to be more like Christ and to make disciples and to live for the good of others. And we should embrace suffering because it is a part of that. If Jesus suffered, we will suffer too. So we embrace it, we're humbled by it, we learn by it. If adversity, if adversity comes in your life and shakes up and reorients your life to that which matters, because you've been chasing after sin, you've been chasing after idols, and praise God, that's a good thing. Adversity has this way of taking us out of control. And, and we come back to our dependency on God. 
Adversity can actually allow you to experience a unique joy that you could not have experienced had everything been easy and had everything gone according to plan. And the last thing I'll say is this, grow and go. Grow and go. Suffering can relate to our character as, as fire relates to gold. It refines it. Suffering allows growth in our character, in our faith, in our perspective. There's no way to know our true character until we are tested. And it is through the testings of our faith that we build resilience, we build endurance. And then as we've suffered, we're actually able to, to empathize with other people who are suffering and going through the same thing. We can relate and encourage them in ways that we weren't able to before. In fact, suffering may actually motivate us to causes that we were otherwise indifferent to. And so this Christmas, coming back to Romans 8, you may be going through tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, or sword, yet through all of these things, we are what? We are more than conquerors through Christ who loves us. All right, finally, and number three, our third reason for Christmas rejoicing we see in verses 19 to 23, it's this, that Jesus loves his fiercest enemy. Here, Matthew actually shows us that Jesus ends up in Nazareth rather than in Judea, so that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, that he shall be called a Nazarene. Now, this is an interesting prophecy because no prophet exclusively actually claims this. In fact, no prophet even talks about Nazareth, so why does Matthew add this? Well, we learn as we read the rest of the gospel accounts that Nazareth was not a respected place. It was kind of at the bottom of the socioeconomic scale, if you will. And if you recall in John's gospel, when Nathanael heard that Jesus was from Nazareth, Nathanael said, can anything good come from Nazareth? And so we learn that Nazarenes were scorned. There's a good word to write down this morning. We don't use that word very often anymore. He was scorned, but it kind of means that he was treated with contempt. Nazarenes were generally just despised. And it is this idea of scorn we see throughout the prophets, perhaps most famously stated in Isaiah 53, when the prophet says, he was despised and rejected by men, and we didn't value him. I believe this is what Matthew is driving at here, that this king is going to be rejected by the world. He will be despised, he will be scorned, he will be a Nazarene, which really is kind of a fitting end to the Christmas story. A fitting end to chapter two in Matthew's book as the king of the universe has come to save sinners and yet from the very start he is derided by the very ones he came to save. Herod, the chief priest, the scribes, they're all setting themselves up against Jesus as enemies and these enemies, the spiritual leaders, will eventually put him to death and yet from the cross, looking his enemies in the face, he would say, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Do you see this morning again the incredible love of our God? The love that made himself nothing. That he took the form of a servant, that he was born in the likeness of men. He humbled himself, he became obedient, obedient even to death on a cross. All so that he could save his best friends? No, so that he could save his enemies. And I realize that we don't like to consider ourselves enemies of God. You know, like I'm a pretty good person for the most part. Like I'm not, I'm certainly not as evil as Herod. Like don't lump me in with him. I'm not an enemy of God. But I want you to think about for a second, what is it that Herod was raging about? What was he so angry and upset about? Herod was afraid of losing his kingdom to Jesus. Herod was afraid of losing his kingdom to Jesus. This is my life. It's my plans. I want things my way. No way I'm submitting to anybody else. Does that self-centeredness sound familiar to you? See, the Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In fact, Romans 5.10 labels those lost in sin as enemies. And this is the hard reality that we need to come to terms with, that you are a sinner in need of saving and you can't save yourself. Are you here this morning and afraid that Jesus is going to invade your kingdom in your plans, in your life? Are you afraid of what you're gonna to have to give up? Do you still think that you're good and not need of saving? Then the reality is you're just like Herod. That's the bad news, here's the good news. The good news of Christmas is that Jesus loves his fiercest enemies. He loves you, he died for you to the glory of God the Father to redeem you and to change you from an enemy to a beloved son and daughter of the King. And now for those of us who are redeemed by Christ, we can actually go and love our enemies. Think about that. That seems radical and that seems hard, but it's the type of total transformation that Jesus brings about in our hearts. We love others the way that Jesus loved us. 
We can actually take joy into the anger and into the hurt of our neighbor's lives. Why? Because we're not living for their approval. We've already been approved by the king. I know, I know that you want joy this Christmas, but I wonder, is life still all about you? Or have you humbled yourself and realized that you're living for something greater? You're living for the glory of God and for the good of others. The calling for us is to actively pursue joy in others. And the crazy thing is that when you pursue the joy in others, it actually makes your own concerns and worries kind of shrink and it makes your joy increase. Well, let me conclude this morning by just wrapping this all up. God's story has always been designed to connect to our story. In fact, it's because of God's story that our stories make sense, that they have meaning, that they carry on into eternity. We too know what it's like to, to long for deliverance from the broken circumstances of this life, just like Israel in slavery in Egypt. We know what it's like to mourn the loss of loved ones and to live through tragedy, just like the families of Ramah and Bethlehem. We too are enemies of God, lost in sin like Herod and the Pharisees. But we can rejoice this Christmas in the midst of trial because Jesus has inaugurated a new exodus. Jesus has come and end the, more, the sorrowful exile and he has loved his enemies, us. We have Jesus, therefore we have joy. We have this internal sense of the goodness of God, but we also keep fighting for that joy as the things of this world and our sin nature seek to steal it away. And how do we do this? We do this by beholding Jesus. We do this by saturating our minds and our hearts with the gospel truths, just like we have just done. It gives us hope in the midst of hurt and it reminds us of our glorious future. I'm gonna stay up, up at the front here so we can pick up the audio for our online service this morning. Um, in Hebrews chapter 12, we read these words. And uh, these words are put in the context of suffering. It begins in chapter 11 with this cloud of witnesses, the, these people who've given their lives for the sake of the gospel, to be tortured, to be killed. And then after that, we have a portion on uh, the discipline of suffering. And in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, we read, Therefore, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that's set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of God. What was that joy? You know, for the joy set before him. We often think, well, it was heaven. And that's partially true. But it was also the joy of obedience. The joy of a love for the Father and doing what he wanted him to do. And um, this morning as we gather around the table and reflect on uh, Christ's sacrifice for us, uh, we want to remember that this is, this is a moment to be able to reflect on our gratitude to God for all that he's done for us through Christ. And that gratitude ought to stir up in us a love for Christ and a joy, a profound joy of being able to have the privilege of doing what he wants. Uh, the joy of a son serving the father out of gratitude and love. Uh, and so... In the midst of our suffering, this side of Eden, in the midst of our sorrow and our hardship and our struggle, we can find, as Pastor Aaron has so powerfully told us this morning, we can find that joy that flows out of a love for Christ. And so we want to take a few moments now as we gather around this table to reflect and give thanks for all that Christ has done. And the Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 11, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Josh, would you give thanks for the bread, please? Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the privilege of being able to meet again this morning. Mm -hmm. 
and to have our minds and our hearts focused on the joy, the joy of being reconciled to you. We who were once your enemy now find peace and reconciliation through your son. We find joy in, in the exile of being led out of slavery to sin, being granted that freedom through the sacrifice of your son. This joy is a joy that, that comes from you. It's a joy, as Pastor Tim mentioned, that, that really comes from Christ, demonstrated at a, at a moment of an intense suffering and anguish. Mm-hmm. As your son hung there, not grudgingly, but out of joy to accomplish our redemption, out of joy to fulfill your will. It's inconceivable to us, Father. Thank you. Thank you for the, the sacrifice of Jesus on our behalf. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's eat together. to read in the same way also he took a cup after supper saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes Mike would you give thanks for the cup please let's pray dear father just thank you for this day thank you for the opportunity as Josh said to come and worship you as a group, Father God. I just thank you for the message to this morning to allow us to see that you are everything for this season, Father God, and you give us joy no matter what our circumstances are, and there is always hope. And let us remind that, especially during this season, because it'll be a different Christmas for many of us, Lord, in different ways of we can't have the usual family get together, some maybe we're putting them on hold because of what's going on. Allow us still to see you and the joy and the hope you have that one day we'll be able to do that again. I just thank you for allowing us to, for giving your son to die on the cross for us, Father God, and allowing his blood to be shed for our sin, Father God. And let us never forget that and always remember that and be grateful for that, Father God. And help us to always be mindful of that, Father God, that we come to you and are short with our account with our sins with you and ask for your forgiveness because you will grant it to us. And I thank you for that, that you continue to do that time and time again every time we mess up. I just pray right now for this cup, Lord, that you, as we take part of it, that we do this in remembrance of you. In your name, amen. Amen. Let's drink together. What a joy as we reflect over the communion service and realize we don't obey out of compulsion or out of religious duty, right? What a joy. It changes everything, right? This is no no longer about having a religion. It's about having a living faith in Christ. And we serve and we obey out of joy by the power of his Holy Spirit. And uh, what a blessing that is. It changes everything, right? Uh, this is what it means to really know Christ and, uh, and to know that joy. And that's why we rejoice. Thank you, Pastor Aaron, for those words that lift us above the circumstances of the life we're in, right? And living life this side of Eden to experiencing that lasting and profound joy. And, you know, I'm glad you made the distinction that it's, this is not about going around being happy all the time, right? But it's having that inner contentment right? That, uh, that changes everything. And that, that's what makes the difference between a religion and a relationship with Jesus. And I pray this morning that if you don't know the reality of that relationship, if you've never, you know, admitted your sin to God and called on Jesus to save you, 
uh, and, and be your savior and, and enter into a relationship with him by faith, that you would do that this morning. I don't know who brought you here this morning, whether it was a friend or a relative, uh, but listen, uh, if, the, if they know Christ, you, you say, hey, I want what Pastor Aaron was talking about, and how can I know Christ this morning? So don't leave this place until you've made that kind of a decision, uh, or you've learned more about it, either by talking to me or Pastor Aaron or anybody on the worship team or that friend who bought you. And uh, let's just uh, take a moment now to bow in a word of prayer. Father, thank you for this opportunity you've given us a new and afresh to hear your good news. The good news of your deliverance from our bondage into sin. Thank you for being that way maker. The one who's pointed the way and shown us the way to experience joy this Christmas season, regardless of the circumstances we're in. Father, thank you for your mercy and grace towards us through Jesus Christ. And we pray now, Lord, that you would enable us by that same grace to enter in to this reality of profound inner joy and contentment. And God, we pray that as we reflect this morning on Christ and as we've thought about his gift of salvation for us, how he died in our place and has given to us his righteousness so that we don't have to try to be good anymore. It's a gift of God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for taking that burden off of us and making for us a way into true joy. Now, Father, we uh, commit this to you now and we give thanks to you uh, for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Are our children, have they come back yet? Are they in the service yet? I don't know if they have.